The dance these men are performing indicates that in a small village called Kete, someone important has just died. Now his relatives must organize very complicated and very expensive funeral rites, which will mark the return of the deceased to the world of his ancestors. For the Toraja, it is very important that the funeral should be a success. If the dead man is satisfied, he will watch over, protect and bring luck to his family. The ceremony will last for several days, and once it is over, the coffin will be placed in a sacred rock along with his ancestors. But before that moment arrives, the family must build a city, sacrifice over 40 buffalo, and welcome and entertain over 2,000 guests in a ritual which is unique in the world. of Sulawesi, the island in the shape of an orchid, the rice fields are ready to be harvested. For centuries, this has been the home of the Toraja, an Indonesian ethnic group structured in a very hierarchical society and ruled over by nobles called Huangs. Rice, along with the coconut palm, is the base of their economy and even the tiniest scrap of land is used to grow it. For centuries they have gradually sculpted terraces along the valleys and mountains, creating in the process one of the most beautiful landscapes in Asia. The land here is rich and generous, and in a good year it is possible to obtain three crops. But this dominance of rice cultivation is relatively recent. In the past, these people lived by hunting and gathering, and their constant tribal conflicts forced them to adopt a nomadic lifestyle. But with the arrival of the Dutch Empire, peace returned to the island, and its inhabitants began to settle and cultivate the land. Though the Portuguese were the first to arrive on the island in 1512, the Dutch began to impose their supremacy from 1607 when Sulawesi became an important province of the Dutch East Indies Company, a government enterprise whose monopoly extended from the Cape of Good Hope to the Magellan Straits. These companies were created in Western Europe during the 17th and 18th centuries in order to exploit trade with Asia and the most important of them had deeds of constitution granted by their respective governments, which authorized them to acquire territories and exercise government functions over them. On the lowlands, the rice fields give way to the palm groves, the most important economic resource in Sulawesi. Thanks to the palm, its people are among the most prosperous in Indonesia especially in the north, where alongside the coconut palms there are plantations growing coffee, vanilla and cloves. <laughs> the possibilities these trees offer the inhabitants of the island are almost unlimited. They eat the flesh of the coconut and drink the milk. They use the wood of the trunk to build their houses. The palm leaves serve to make roofs, hammocks, baskets and ropes. And the oil is used for cooking and lighting and is sold to the cosmetics multinationals to make soaps, perfumes, moisturizers and even nitroglycerine. In 
In the village of Kete, the friends and relatives of the dead man, Mayana, have been preparing the ceremony for several days now. Mayana was a puang, that is, a noble, and therefore the ceremony must be very special, attention paid to every single detail. Once they have finished decorating the village, they must build another one not far from here to house the guests. That is where the funeral will be held. For Mayana's family, this will mean absolute ruin. And it'll be several generations before the debt, some $26,000 is fully paid off. To raise the money, they have had to sell rice fields and cattle and request loans from the wealthier relatives. But they must impress the gods. And if Mayana is satisfied, the family will be sure to go to heaven. Kete is a typical Toraya village composed of two parallel rows of houses built on stilts and called Tongkonan, which symbolize the union of the family and the clan. The enormous roofs are made of layers of bamboo cane sealed with a vegetable paste extracted from the bamboo itself, which makes them waterproof, absolutely vital when the rainy season arrives. The facade is decorated with geometric paintings and each color has a meaning. Red symbolizes human life, white is the color of bones, a symbol of purity, yellow represents the blessing of God and power, and black means death and darkness. A carving of a buffalo head decorates the central part of each house. Numerous horns from animals sacrificed at past funerals give an idea of the wealth of the family and are tied to the central pillar that supports the roof. These houses are closely linked with Toraja traditions, and one of their functions is to serve as a constant reminder of the authority of the noble families whose descendants have maintained them and may not sell them. But the strangest thing about this architecture is the shape of the roofs, and there are a number of theories about the origin of this. Some say they represent the horns of a buffalo, others that they point the way towards heaven. But the majority believe the roof looks more like a boat, and its pointed ends representing the prow and the stern. The houses face north, possibly because their ancestors came from that direction in boats which, when they arrived, were turned upside down to use as shelters. The origin of the Toraja is to be found in the foothills of the Himalayas, and in the past they were fierce headhunters. After the invasion of the Bugi people 600 years ago, the Toraja were driven into the center of the island while Muslims occupied the coasts and the lowlands. The name Toraja means men of the mountains. The inhabitants of Sulawesi have always had a very close relationship with the sea. Along the beaches, they continue to build in the traditional way the Pinisi, the famous Indonesian boats that for centuries now have crossed these seas, trading and transporting goods among the 14,000 islands that make up the Indonesian archipelago. These men belong to the Bugi ethnic group, considered the best boat builders and sailors in the Indian Ocean. Such was their supremacy in these seas that in the 17th and 18th centuries, they established important trade centers in what today is Singapore, the island of Borneo, and the Malaysian Peninsula, controlling marine traffic in the South China and Java seas. But there is another ethnic group which lives in even closer contact with the sea. In fact, they could not conceive of life without it. That group is the Bajau. At the other end of the island in the calm waters of the Gulf of Tomini, these nomads have for centuries conquered the sea. They live out their lives on these small, fragile boats called lepers where they are born 
marry, reproduce, and die. In them they move along the coast, propelled by the winds and the currents, and rarely set foot on dry land. Such is their affinity with the sea, that when they come on land they feel unhappy. They say that, just as a turtle or a fish would die if it were stranded on the coast, without the sea they too would die, for here they feel they are free. Their origins remain unknown, though some anthropologists believe they come from the south of the Malaysian peninsula. Apparently, at the start of the 17th century, they were forced to abandon their homes due to the constant tribal conflicts and political instability. They sailed along the coast of Borneo, then headed south of the Philippines, eventually arriving on the eastern coast of Sulawesi. They, however, claim their ancestors set out in search of their lost princess. According to this legend, the princess was bathing on the shore when a sudden storm carried her out to sea. She managed to cling to some tree trunks and for weeks drifted before finally reaching Sulawesi. When the Bajau found her, they decided to remain and live here. Since then, countless legends have surrounded these gypsies of the sea. In the 18th century, they contributed to the maritime expansion of the kingdom of Siriwijaja and two centuries before had fought to defend the Sultan of Malacca. Some of them became famous pirates, spreading fear among the traders, and their journeys across the seas became legendary. For centuries, they held sway over this blue desert. They rarely venture far from the coast. Their lives are spent fishing close by the mangrove swamps and the coral reefs. Here, they find almost everything they need. The mangrove swamps are an essential barrier between the land and the sea. They protect the land from erosion, which would cloud the waters of the coral reefs, killing the corals and with them all the animals that live there. And the rich, complex system of mangrove roots also provides food and shelter for animals and humans. The Bajau know many different fishing methods, but perhaps the most curious one of all is this one, fishing with kites. The technique they use is simple, but very effective. It consists of attaching a hook to the kite, which is made from fern leaves, and with the help of a pole, the fisherman can move the hook as far out as he wants. The swaying of the kite keeps the bait in constant movement, attracting above all the flying fish. This fisherman is called Jared, and until eight years ago he lived in Aleppo. Like many other Bajaos, Jared decided to join a government settlement and education plan. Now he lives with his wife and four children in this village of stilt houses called Torosiyaji. The government tried to house the first families along the coast, but they were unable to adapt to dry land and soon returned to their boats. Then the Bajau suggested building the village over the sea, and so Toro Siyaji was born. Today it is a prosperous, well-organized community of 300 families who have electricity, a small clinic, a school and a mosque, and every year new buildings are added to this floating city. The 
Though the greatest number of Bajaos live in Sulawesi, there are also groups of them in Myanmar, where they are called Moken, or the people drowned by the sea. In Thailand, they are known as the Chao Nam, or water people, and they can also be found along the coasts of the Philippines and Vietnam. Despite this diaspora and the enormous distances separating them, they have in common the same maritime culture, characterized by their profound knowledge of the seas. The mosque and the school are the only buildings in Torres Yaji standing on dry land. Well, not exactly dry land, because they have been built on foundations made of coral. Hi. Though the government's main aim is that they should settle and the children should go to school, it respects those who have decided to preserve their traditional way of life. And every day, a number of canoes sail out to the lepers to take the children of the nomads to the school. At low tide, the shellfish can be easily gathered. This is the time of greatest activity. Observing the seaweed, they know what day of the month it is. This is their natural calendar, which never fails. When the seaweed opens up to release the seeds, it is the third day of the month. Between the 10th and the 15th, they again open. From the 16th to the 20th, they remain closed. And from the 20th to the end of the month, their color becomes more intense. At midday, the waters are very shallow, and this is when the Bajau comb the sea bottom in search of food. Their basic diet is fish and rice. The rice they buy in the markets on the coast, where once a week the women go to sell the fish they have caught and buy basic necessities such as fresh water. The most highly valued seafood is the trepang, a kind of cucumber especially sought after in China due to its curative powers and which represents their greatest income, and these giant oysters which they can serve by smoking. The Bajau are also magnificent divers and can remain underwater for over five minutes and dive down up to 15 meters. To be able to remain so long without breathing, they use their stomach muscles to dose out the oxygen, controlling the air released from their lungs. When diving, they use small goggles the glass of which is made from polished pieces of tortoiseshell. specifically from the south of Sulawesi to the north of the island of Flores, is the third longest in the world after those in Australia and Cuba. Here, the Indian and Pacific Oceans come together, creating the warmest waters in the world, the perfect place for coral to develop. This world of light and color began to be formed 25 million years ago from the accumulation of skeletons composed of calcium carbonate of animal and vegetable origin. The 
coral reefs constitute the oldest of all natural communities and the ones which contain the greatest diversity of life on Earth. Nowhere else in the world is it possible to find so many different living beings in such close contact and in such great numbers. It is the most complex aquatic ecosystem on the planet. Such variety of life makes effective visual communication necessary to send out signals of warning, confusion or hiding, and so the fish of the coral reef have developed extraordinary colors and designs. This is a beautiful sea, but one which contains many dangers. There are some 400 types of coral and over 1,500 species of fish. Some of them so incredibly beautiful, it seems as if each plant or animal is trying to outdo the others. But this evolution has been a slower process in the reef than in other much less stable environments where adaptations and extinctions are frequent due to important changes in the ecosystem. The stability of the reef is not however static, quite the opposite, it's incredibly dynamic. Populations of different species vary considerably but the overall community is maintained. The important thing is not who performs a given function, but that it is performed by someone. A multitude of organisms with different capacities to carry out different functions allows the reefs to overcome setbacks that would devastate less flexible communities. Nonetheless, with global warming and ultraviolet radiation, coral in different places around the world is undergoing a process known as coral bleaching, which consists of whitening due to the loss of symbiotic zooxanthellae, and so many of them have atrophied lower limbs. The origin could lie in the fact that the waters are unusually warm. The optimum temperature for the growth of coral is between 26 and 27 degrees centigrade. Above this temperature, the coral suffers stress, which intensifies and speeds up the bleaching process. At dusk, the boats that have been out hunting come together again. These apparently fragile floating houses are made of wood from the api tree and are incredibly resistant, able to withstand an entire lifetime on the sea. There is virtually no space in which to move, so much so that the people have stunted legs. The kitchen is in the stern, in the middle the bedrooms and the larder, and in the prow the living room. Though it would seem impossible, an entire family of five members can live on a single boat. They may have very little living space, but the world that surrounds them is in constant change and movement, is open and free. When a child comes into the world, its father throws it into the water to initiate it into this marine environment. At four years old, the child already knows how to maneuver the leper, and by the time they are seven, they know all the fishing techniques. They live in such close contact with the sea that when they are born, they are given names that describe the surroundings at the time of their birth. 
Here we find names such as bird alighting on a palm tree that has fallen into the water, three black clouds in the sky, or eastern storm with strong winds. Like every day at sunset, the children of Torosiaji go to the mosque to receive their Koran classes. The Bajau are Muslims, though they also practice animism and shamanism. Islam arrived in Indonesia at the end of the 18th century, introduced by Muslim traders from India. Nonetheless, they continue to believe in Pangroak Kampo, the spirits that control their world. Any happiness or illness is a reflection of their power. That is why it's important to keep them happy, so they'll protect you when the sea grows furious and will keep the world in balance. The day is coming to an end in the calm waters of the Gulf of Tomini. It is time for the Bajau to take their boats alongside the mangrove swamps where they will be protected. These nomads of the sea, like the immense majority of traditional communities on this earth, are facing immense profound changes. Little by little they are disappearing in silence and with them centuries of wisdom forged and practiced over time. There is a Bajau saying that reads, we conserve only what we love, we love only what we understand, and we understand only what we have been taught. It's been three months since Mayana died, and finally everything is ready for the funeral ceremony. During this time, the body has been preserved, having been injected with a concoction made from special flowers and grasses. On occasions, they preserve the body for up to 20 years, until the family has been able to raise the money needed for the burial. Officially, the funeral cannot begin until the coffin leaves the family home and is placed in a small sanctuary on the Rante, the terrace where the ceremony will take place. Once the coffin has been carried in and placed on the catafalque, it begins its journey through the jungle, preceded by the women closest to the deceased, who hold a long red cloth as a symbol of the road that must be followed in order to reach Puya, heaven. This short journey to the Rante is also the occasion for the neighbors who have not been invited to the burial to express their condolences to the family of the deceased.
Meanwhile, Batu, the carpenter of Kete, is hurrying to complete a sculpture of the deceased Mayana. These figures are called Tao Tao and are a symbol of the Toraja culture. They are life-size and though traditionally they only depicted the gender of the person, now they try to make them resemble the deceased. The Tao Tao are paid for by the entire community in appreciation of the generosity of the deceased and are almost exclusively the privilege of the upper classes. In the rock crevices around the region of Tana Toraya, dozens of these human figures stare out from their wooden balconies on the cliff face, watching over the spirits. The figures are dressed and decorated with clothes and jewelry which belong to the deceased, and on occasion, the wigs are made from their real hair. It is a relatively recent custom which began in the 19th century, and the type of wood used is indicative of the social position of the dead person. But after so many years of funerals, there remain few rocks and escarpments in which to bury the bodies. And though the aim is that the family should remain united even after death, the lack of space means coffins often have to be placed in bamboo structures in the open air. In time, the wood has rotted, converting these sacred rocks into macabre, sinister places. Children who die before their teeth appear are buried in the trunks of these trees because for the Toraja, they still belong to Mother Nature and as such should remain with her. The soul will travel to heaven up the trunk. In the sacred rocks of Rante Pao, the workers excavate new spaces in which to bury Mayana alongside his ancestors. Here there are no mechanical excavators or pneumatic drills. Everything is done with hammer blows, so the construction of a family pantheon can take several months, determining the date on which the funeral can be held. The Toraja prefer to hold the ceremony during the dry season, that is between June and September, which is when they have most time, as the rice fields require very little care. For this work, Mayana's family will have to pay five buffaloes. On the island of Sulawesi, it is customary to use these animals as currency. After two hours bumping along the road, the catafalque finally arrives at the place Mayana's family has constructed to hold a funeral ceremony. The most surprising thing is the party atmosphere. It's difficult to imagine, especially for Westerners, that we're at a funeral. But this also forms part of the ritual. The families of the dead man and his widow compete over the catafalque to demonstrate the strength of the clan. And in the middle, the poor Mayana who, if he came back to life now, would surely beg to again return to his eternal rest. With spirit somewhat calmer, the catafalque is taken down to transfer the coffin to the sanctuary.
Once it has been placed inside with the head pointing west, the funeral can officially begin. From now on and for five days, the piece of kete will be broken as never before. The morning of the second day rises clear and sunny. The over 2,000 guests who have arrived from all corners of Indonesia, Borneo, Java, Sumatra, Lombok, Bali, Flores, are welcomed with offerings of betel and spice cigarettes. Three dancers lead the procession and between songs and cries, announce where each group has come from. The sound of the gong marks the rhythm of the ceremony and little by little the atmosphere becomes more solemn. Mayana's grandchildren line up to receive the condolences and to thank the guests for their presence. The protocol is very important and many rules have to be respected so that no one feels offended. In the background, the widows remain sitting beside the coffin, cooking food which they offer to the dead man. An invitation to visit the deceased is a real honor, and it is considered impolite to say no. If you accept, you will have to ask the dead man for permission to leave, just as if he were still alive. Each group of guests is preceded by their offerings, this is the perfect time to demonstrate how well you are doing in life. And there are constant exclamations at the number of animals a single individual is capable of giving, or the size of some of the pigs, like this one. It's all ten men can do to get it out of the van. The quality of the gifts is inspected and duly registered. In the past, they would be simply etched in the memories of the old people, but today every detail is carefully written down. The most appreciated, without a doubt, are the albino buffaloes, which here are called Tedong Bonga, and can cost over $1,000. A fortune if we consider that the average salary of a civil servant is scarcely $120 a month. Funerals are a good occasion to settle certain debts. In Tana Toraya, a gift received now is seen as a debt that must be paid back later. The gifts the deceased's family receives will have to be repaid in the future by attending other funerals for years to come. Once the guests have been shown to their places, one of the highlights will begin, the buffalo fight. The Turaja people are proud to test the bravery of the buffaloes and demonstrate that the deceased will be accompanied to heaven by such powerful and courageous animals. A group of men dressed in black sarongs form a circle, dancing and singing the Mabadong, a morning dance with a double purpose, prayer and entertainment. In this dance only men participate, 
and they make slow circular movements, the circle of life, linking their little fingers so there is a connection between all of them. The second day of the funeral is coming to an end. Mayana's family is very happy with the gifts they have received and it is time to repay the guests for their generosity. The young women hand out honey cakes, tea, coffee, rice and palm wine. The third day is the most important. A lot of buffalo have to be sacrificed if you are to live happily and be respected in paradise. The souls of the dead can only go to Puya when the death ritual is completed. The status of a spirit in the world beyond is the same as that of the person in this life, and so the souls of his animals must follow him into the other life. With this sacrifice, the deceased will be accompanied to heaven by the souls of buffaloes and pigs. The journey to Puya requires strong animals because it is difficult and mountains and valleys must be crossed. The buffalo has traditionally been the symbol of wealth and power, used even to pay for land. But the fact that so many are sacrificed in honor of the dead, in order to impress the living, has led the Indonesian government to impose limits and taxes for each animal sacrificed, as these ostentatious ceremonies end up by ruining the families. The tensest moment in any celebration is the sharing out of the meat, and there are always disputes and even fights. What each guest receives depends on many factors. For example, if they are owed a debt, they will receive a good portion as part of the payment. Noble families that are descended directly from heaven have the right to the head, the most highly prized part, and the children receive the legs. On the last day in the village of Kete, the atmosphere is completely different from the revelry of the first days. After three intense days of celebration, the pain and tiredness begin to show in the faces of the closest relatives. The men continue dancing the Mabadong, while the women kneeling before the coffin shed their last tears, moved by the song sung by the children. The funeral is drawing to an end, and in just a few hours, Mayana will rest in peace along with his ancestors in the sacred rocks of Rantepao.
hour later, Mayana is taken on his final journey across the rice fields. At the same time, in the neighboring village of Rumki, another family is also preparing to transport a dead man to the sacred rocks. Though at first the procession tries to keep up appearances and maintain their composure as protocol demands in these cases, little by little the atmosphere heats up and what was meant to be a walk of sorrow and contemplation turns into a mad dash both families trying to see who is capable of guiding the coffin across the rice fields. The dead man is no longer the center of attention as a real pitched battle of water and mud is unleashed. Astonishingly, from what we saw just a moment ago, Mayana's family has managed to make the journey without too much uproar, and in less than two hours has reached the sacred rocks. Right at the foot of the niche, the officiating priest says the final farewell to the dead man, reading a few paragraphs from the Bible. The majority of the Toraya are Christians, though, like the Bajau, they combine their new religion with animist beliefs based on a large, complicated mythology that divides all of creation into three worlds, each one with its own God. Mayana has come to the end of his journey. After the celebration to pay their respects to him, he must surely be grateful and satisfied. The family, for its part, has reinforced its honor and status, strengthening bonds and demonstrating its wealth and generosity. The coffin has been placed inside the rock, along with his most beloved belongings. Then they seal forever the door to his new home. And that is a funeral in the highlands of Sulawesi, the island in the shape of an orchid.